Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of The Hot Seat, a wireless design and development interview series where we talk about the latest wireless technologies, components, and design issues for the wireless design engineering community. Recently, we spoke with Larry Morell, Executive Vice President, Marketing and Business Development, Larry Morell at Cavendish Kinetics. Larry joined Cavendish in 2009 from Impinge, where he was Vice President and General Manager of the IP Products Division. The division created and licensed Eon non-volatile memory IP for semiconductor companies. Earlier, Larry directed marketing for Cypress Computer Products Division, which launched the USB and programmable clock product lines. Prior to Cypress, he was Vice President of Marketing and Business Development for Data.io Corporation, and he also held various engineering and marketing positions at Seattle Silicon and the Boeing Company. In this episode of The Hot Seat, Larry talks about how form factors for today's mobile devices are driving a fundamental change in antenna design strategy. Mobile phones are continuing to get thinner and more complex. How is the design of the antenna changing to fulfill the demand of thinner phones? Well, thank you, uh, Megan. Thank you very much for that question. So just a bit of a history lesson here. Uh, so phones for the last few years have been evolving quite dramatically. Here's a phone from about 10 years ago. And the antenna for this phone looks like this. It's a pentaband antenna, so it has five bands it can support. And you can see it's got a fairly thick uh, form factor, so the volume for this antenna is actually pretty significant. Uh, phones have now evolved to something like this. This is a modern smartphone that currently on the market today. So it's the phone that I'm currently using. And it's a lot thinner, which means that inside you have got much less volume you can use for the antenna. So here's, this is not from this particular phone, but here is an antenna from a current smartphone. Now you can see the thinness is uh, just dramatically different. And so the volume of the antenna that the antenna designer has to work with has been shrinking dramatically. So what that means is that the antenna designer has to be using now more and more tricks to get these antennas to do more things in smaller volume. And uh, that's, that's a problem with physics. It's a problem with technology, and the antenna designers are kind of uh, up against it now. So they're, so they're using things like uh, tunability, using things like uh, narrow band antennas that can have uh, frequencies that shift between different bands depending upon what frequency is in use at the moment. So that's what they're having to do. And users also are demanding more data at faster rates, and more data means more frequencies used by the carrier. So how can antennas do multiple bands? Well, that's a, another big challenge. Um, this antenna I showed you before has got multiple traces on it, if you can kind of see that. Uh, the traces are different links of the antenna element itself, and each element can resonate at a different frequency. So for a quad band or a pentaband antenna, that's not a problem. You simply have multiple traces, and each trace has a different resonant frequency. When you get down to today's phones that have uh, LTE bands Maybe you have to support 12 or 15 bands even from 800 megahertz up to 2.7 gigahertz, which is a, a factor of over three to change the uh, the resonant frequencies. You can't you can't do that. There's no space to do it. So the antenna designers are going to have to have different ways to use the phone itself. So this uh, antenna I showed you before, this is not the whole antenna. The antenna actually wraps around the entire phone, and so that allows the antenna itself to resonate it. Well, low frequencies and high frequencies at the same time. So if you have a way to tune each of those bands, you can have a high resonant uh, resonance, uh, medium, medium band resonance, and a low band resonance. And if you can adjust those resonances, now you can cover all those different bands when you need them one or two at a time. And are their users really getting what they're paying for with four LTE speeds? And what are your thoughts on 4G LTE Advance and how will that affect antenna design? Well, the short answer is no. Antenna designers uh, know this quite well uh, and the phone makers are now struggling trying to hit the uh, Cat4, Cat5, Cat6, Cat7 speed uh, standards that are currently uh, at, in, in, at, in deployed at least at base stations. So users from, so here's a, a, a 3G phone that used to be my phone from uh, an iPhone 3G. And this one had uh, very good, uh, you know, several hundred uh, kilobytes of data transfer, which was you know, state of the art five years ago. Uh, the one we've got today, you know, the one I showed you earlier, 
Now this phone is supposed to be able to transmit up to uh, 10 megabits per second, but it doesn't really. It transmits probably at 20% of that and receives uh, even slower. So although it's much faster than the phones of past years, it's not as fast as the system itself would allow. So users don't really know what it is they're missing because it's faster than it used to be, but it's not as fast as you could have. If the phones had better RF connections across the board, and they vary a lot from maker to maker, then users would see double, triple, or even 5x the data rates that they're seeing today. So once a few phones are out there, and there's a couple of them that are doing very well, they'll be able to see that there is, in fact, a way to download your website faster, to upload your videos quicker, to download uh, movies and so on at a faster rate, then you would see a significant uh, significant change in the in the way the users perceive this. So what what do carriers do? What are some of the things that they they need to be aware of? Well, the carriers are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. They have spent billions and billions of dollars on acquiring frequencies that they can deploy across their networks, upgrading their base stations so they can support. 2G and 3G and 4G and even LTE advanced in uh, many geographies. So they have made uh, significant capital investments to make this uh, problem kind of go away and, and improve the data rates for the users. So what they're having to do now is focus more on the mobile side, the mobile device itself. And so they are tightening down the specs that they'll accept on their networks. They're being more rigorous in the testing that they do. And they are going back to their OEM suppliers and demanding that they have better performance on the RF and they have better testing so that when they deploy these devices on their networks, they have uh, much higher predictability. There is an innovative operator in Australia called uh, Telstra. And Telstra has a fairly interesting program. They have a program called uh, BlueTick. And the BlueTick goes next to a device that has relative RF performance and the way it's measured in Australia is by coverage how much area could a particular um, cell phone cover how far could it reach from a base station so if devices outperform the spec and there's an additional test that Telstra does they get a, a blue tick next to their uh, product on their website and so this blue tick tells consumers this product is a superior performing data product is superior performing as far as uh, cellular coverage goes. And so they are helping to educate users that there's a difference between these different phones and that will help, we think, drive the users to pick phones that do indeed have better performance, which will then drive the OEMs to also make uh, devices that are performing much better. And Larry, from an, inter from an industry perspective, what are some of the things that keep you up at night? <laughs> well, from a job standpoint, uh, thing I most worry about is that the bureaucrats and politicians that assign frequencies will come to their senses and make this all easy and then, then we lose our jobs and we all go away. So that's not going to happen. Uh, the thing that keeps me up at night is how quickly we can get designers onto some new design techniques using newer technologies. I mentioned this antenna I showed you before. Uh, it's, it looks like a fairly simple antenna, but it's actually got, if you look on this side, there are multiple contacts on this uh, antenna. You can see there's four different contacts right here and some more contacts on the edge. The previous antennas will only have two or three contacts. Now those contacts are going to smart tuning circuits. And those circuits allow this antenna, although it looks fairly simple, to operate between uh, 800 megahertz and 2.7 gigahertz by using some uh, some tuning technology in this case from Cavendish. So the major challenge is how quickly can we get antenna designers to adopt a tuning antenna approach so that they can indeed follow the trends uh, create antennas that can cover all these bands. So mostly it's an educational issue that I wrestle with. Was there anything else, Larry, that you would like to add or comment add that you think is important for our viewers to know, especially about Cavendish and some of the things we might be expecting to see from them in the, the future? The uh, I mentioned tuning technology in the antenna. You're going to see tuning and a lot of antennas uh, being kind of standard uh, equipment from now on. And okay. antenna designers today are now creating different kinds of antenna structures that are more uh, amenable to tuning. You can't use 
tuning on an old style antenna, you have to actually think about tuning as part of your design process. So Cavendish has been working with all the leading antenna makers for describing how you can incorporate tuning in your design methodology, how you can create a good tuning solution that has wide uh, performance across good performance across wide bands and how you can even uh, address some of the things coming up shortly called carrier aggregation. Now carrier aggregation allows for multiple frequencies to be used at the same time. So this is a huge issue for the RF chain and so you need to have some very good isolation in your device. You need to have some very good measurement systems so you can predict exactly which frequency bands you can use at what times. And so we're working with a lot of antenna companies to help uh, solve that problem. It requires very high linearity parts, which we have. It also requires, as I said before, some innovative antenna designs. Uh, we have an antenna design group in our company, and we're helping antenna companies understand how to come to grips with some of these uh, future issues. So anyway, that as far as your users, your readers, uh, uh, I'd like to tell them the ideas that the, the new technologies are being adopted and that there's uh, going to be some, some fairly significant changes in the way you'll see antennas perform in the future. Great. Well, I want to take this time to thank you for joining us on this episode of The Hot Seat. We really appreciate it. I appreciate the time, Megan.